So now that the micro uh, level issues of social learning uh, and governance uh, and um, the state dependent, so to speak, uh, has been discussed. We move now to issues of what Ulanovic calls, I guess, process variables and the process ecology and what I call a mission-oriented research agenda on cooperation. And this, in fact, within the cooperative economy towards the stakeholder of democracy is actually the final uh, chapter it's chapter 11, and it established, in fact, establishes a research agenda based on the third research strand that I present in a moment and provides preliminary results thereof. And it, in fact, is the culmination of a multi year research project studying the potential for incorporating ecological concepts and tools into economic and social policy research. In particular, the motivation is both Mariana Masocato's notion of a mission oriented economy as well as Marvin Brown's observation of the common ancestry of economics and ecology. Both come from the Greek root word oikos, which means house or household. Ecology is the logic or study logos of the household. Economics, on the other hand, is the management or nomos of the household. Although one, this is what Brown argues, one would assume that we try to understand something ecology before managing it, economics, it seems that modern economics has ignored the logic or patterns of ecosystems. So Brown. Thus, the thesis that understanding should precede management underlies this research strand and its mission orientation places it in a position to reflect first on the context of relevance before moving on to management of resources. This puts it in line with the vision of commons governance spelled out by Eleanor Ostrom in her pathbreaking work. But apart from Ostrom, uh, as argued above, the current solution is, the correct solution, excuse me, is not always to organize first locally. As Yoshai Benkla has also argued that commons-based beer production can actually uh, change the context of dependence uh, that depends in, uh, on the level of knowledge of stakeholders, their ability and willingness to communicate and the effectiveness of efforts at lower levels to translate to higher order organizations. So things like the internet, of course, change the dynamics and many other aspects. So anyway, to stop with all of the teasing of this agenda and to get basically into the, into the root of it, uh, it's not a very positive picture here, but you'll see in a moment why I put this here. This is the burning house. So the question I can begin this, uh, one of these la latter lectures with, I assume there will be three lectures. This will be the, the uh, third to last lecture. Uh, in a paper presented at the 15th annual Kapolani conference at Concordia University, I argued that an economic policy perspective requires multiple logics, including both normative and descriptive logics. In that paper, I argued for the benefit of a non-reductionist ecological view embracing the self-reflection of complex systems and an aversion to reductionist modes of thought with regards to such complex systems. According to such a perspective, it is generally ill-advised to locate the roots of emergent causes and complex systems in the system's individual components. In the paper, I summarized three historical events or issues that embody such an ecological approach. The development, firstly, of the rise of fire and property insurance, and so now you see why the picture's there, in the late medieval period, the development of the influenza vaccine in the aftermath of World War II, and the push to institute international uh, tax, minimum tax standards to avoid tax evasion. I review each of these three very briefly. The ascendant shift from growth to development that I've spoken of in the process ecology discussion of the last module can actually be seen in all of these cases. In the case of fire insurance, we see how in the light of industrialization and urbanization, well, rather not necessarily industrialization, but later industrialization, firstly urbanization, larger scale collective choice mechanisms could help order an increasingly large and interdependent system of citizens living together. Regardless of the personalities and preferences of individuals. Similarly, a shift to work and ordering activity from the growth activity can be seen in the relevant case of the development of the influenza vaccine. 
as opposed to allowing a varying set of self-interested actors like for for-profit firms to determine the research and development budgets and itinerary of vaccine development and supply distribution, a mix in, this was in 1947, immediately after the Second World War, a mix of over 120, I think in that case, and now over 150 countries are actively involved in coordinating information and developing two seasonal influenza vaccine each year since the founding of the Global System for Influenza Surveillance and Responsive System, GSISRS, in 1947, uh, which now has been called GAVI. Similarly, as opposed to allowing money flows to simply find their bliss, creating international standards to both order flows for the purpose of stabilization and at the same time mitigate individual nations' motivations to opportunistically undercut their neighbors, or uh, this would appear to follow, follow this rule. Um, lastly, in the case of tax evasion, coordination among individual states essentially is conducive to opportunistic behavior. And we again require coercion in the form of punishment for deviating from the norm, as Marcus Mainz has argued. In this case, again, a shift to higher order level, uh, for instance, the OECD, the G20, and other such entities was required to carry out meaningful reform. Whether the 15% global tax rate that was agreed upon is sufficient need not interest us here. What concerns us more is the fact that problems of a global dimension require global solutions, and it is often difficult to organize such at lower levels in such an environment. Uh, it requires notions like um, negotiated coordination and a process-based focus that, that integrates various levels or attempts to find non-reductionistic solutions. To pressing social problems. With these preliminary remarks out of the way, I can now introduce the third research strand and the last one that I will be introducing. The third research strand is actually an ecosystem and mission approach to cooperation. And of course, there's a picture of the Florentine Cathedral here. And at the very end of this uh, discussion, I will return to why I have a picture of the Cathedral of Florence here. Uh, the third class of studies, now we've had the other two in preceding videos, consists in ecological approaches to understanding firms as elements in networks of interdependence. While this interdependence is often implicitly assumed or taken as extending only to known relations, for instance, business partners and Mark Ranovetter's work, we are interested in investigating the potential for employing the seven cooperative principles and values, but especially principles six and seven, to explicitly embed a cooperative logic into enterprises, extending the relational perspective to stakeholders beyond an individual firm's existing business partners. This analysis largely involves an ecosystems analysis, which combines on the one hand, an assessment of individual enabling environments, considering both legal and institutional frameworks and rules. In particular, uh, and returning to Marvin Brown's point that I, that I cited uh, previously, the perspective encourages first understanding the environment before moving on to managing it. At the same time, this ecosystems analysis combines this approach with an analytical framework of the cooperative n tuple helix, which I have introduced in the prior module, at the very end of the prior module, I think it was video number eight of module three, uh, which takes as its point of departure the Dutch communications theorist Lute Leidesdorf's concept of a triple helix and applies an explicitly cooperative logic to this concept. Following the perspective of a cooperative and triple helix, we're interested in measuring the redundancies between different stakeholders as a result of the creation of an explicit framework for creating both overlaps and specializations among stakeholders connected by a cooperative and triple helix. This uh, research is still at an early stage, but a recent breakthrough by Leidestolf and colleagues has derived a so-called calculus of redundancy that provides a basis for not only conceptualizing, but physically measuring such redundancies. Why do such things matter? One of the arguments Leidestolf makes in his book is that since Max Weber introduced the concept of Wertfreiheit into social science discourse, a preference has developed for basing evaluations of policy on objective criteria. Thus, applying the calculus of redundancy to potential cooperative n tuple helixes provides an estimate of the prospective stimulus such an endeavor can have, both in terms of historically generated institutions and structures and in terms of the parameters by which such structures are evaluated, what Leidestolf refers to as an 
evolutionary dynamics of, in this case, cooperative knowledge. Thus, the approach promises to provide a strong criterion for translating policy proposals into a language that can be understood not just by scientists, but also practitioners and importantly by governments. It is the lack of a communicative focus that has arguably weighed down past scientific innovations and prevented them from proliferating. Examples of such a cooperative integral helix are presented uh, in uh, the following several case studies. Um, one of which uh, focuses on Italy's ecosystem of community cooperatives, specifically focused on those in Apulia, which were those that were first formally uh, founded as such. The second uh, is the turn towards new models of community ownership and uh, hacking of uh, legal codes in the UK towards more cooperative uh, and employee friendly businesses. And lastly, in Berlin's startup platform cooperative scene. These case studies presented should be interpreted as preliminary applications of the mission oriented approach to cooperation that I have that I advocate for. The first case study I have entitled Leveraging Strong Regions for Development in the Mezzogiorno, which is the south of Italy, uh, and focusing on particularly Italy's community cooperatives. As is known by many, of course, Italy is the Western country with the largest number of cooperatives and persons employed in cooperatives. At present, Italy's cooperatives make up more than 8% of Italy's gross domestic product and fully 20% of the population are members of one or another cooperative. One third of Italians buy in consumer cooperatives and the Italian model has proved to be resilient to the global financial crisis of 2008, which racked Italy particularly hard. Employment at Italian cooperatives has doubled in the last 10 years, and the sector was responsible for nearly a third of all jobs created in the decade between 2001 and 2011, as Piero Amigato has stated in his um, very fascinating book. All of this points to Italy as a startling example of cooperative economies, and one that deserves to be studied in detail in order to uh, that lessons learned be applied in elsewhere in the world. Uh, I've, the overview is organized as follows. I begin with an overview of the origins of the Lega Cooperativa and early developments in the Italian cooperative movement, I th very briefly, and then I continue to look at the unique legal situation in Italy uh, with respect to cooperatives. Um, and then I do trace the historical developments within Lega Coop of the existence of community cooperatives. The first uh, Italian cooperative was established in Turin in 1854. It was actually a consumer cooperative um, based on the Rochdale principles. The uh, first uh, worker cooperative was founded in 1856 by glass blowers in Altare. Uh, and actually there's an industrial district around that area specialized in this area. In any case, the, the Federazione Nazionale della Cooperativa was founded in 1886, adopting its present name Lega Nazionale della Cooperative e Mutue or Lega Coop a few years later. Init I think it was 1893. Initiating, uh, initially consisting of 248 cooperatives, the central goal from the start was to lobby the government for tax concessions and access to public works contracts. Italian cooperatives were granted concessions that allowed them to win public contracts without bidding. Throughout the pre-fascist era, the cooperative sector held a privileged status thanks to a virtuous cycle of support from a wide spectrum of social reformers, including liberal Republicans like Giuseppe Mazzini and Luigi Dussati, the Catholic Church and numerous communist and socialist groups and unions. Indeed, these three tendencies each had their own affiliated federations of cooperatives and uh, successors of which still make up the largest three cooperative federations today. AGC, which is the liberal cooperatives and the smallest of the three federations, CON Cooperativi for the Catholic cooperatives and Lega Coop for the leftist, socialist or communist cooperatives, which is the largest, is the oldest, Lega Coop is the oldest and largest of these federations. Cooperatives under Italian law are governed by a general assembly whose powers include electing a board of directors, approving the firm's budget, and deciding the distribution of profits. 
since the Italian legal structure is unique among economies today, uh, I do return to this legal structure at present a bit. And I've discussed a few of these uh, in, in past videos, specifically the Basalia law, uh, founding the modern social cooperatives uh, and uh, closing the, uh, the psychiatric clinics. Um, I think it was video four of module three. The Italian legal structure was greatly responsible for the promotion of cooperatives. As mentioned, uh, the, before the fascist period, which is 1921 to 1943, cooperatives were exempt from the contract bidding on small contracts. After the Second World War, laws like the Basevi Law, which was drafted in 1947, made the state directly responsible for um, the promotion of cooperatives. In fact, the existence of cooperatives is actually is enshrined into the uh, Italian constitution by uh, Article 45, which establishes their socially beneficent role. Uh, I'm now reading the 45th article of the Italian constitution. The Republic recognizes the social function of cooperation of a mutually supportive, non-speculative nature. The law promotes and encourages cooperation through appropriate measures and ensures its character and purposes through appropriate checks. Cooperatives uh, experience, including worker cooperative, experienced a number of advantages via taxation. For instance, worker cooperatives are, were exempted from taxes if labor costs exceeded 60% of total cost and from competitive bid bidding on small public works contracts. In addition to these advantages, strict regulations determined what could be done with profits and dictated membership growth policies. Co-ops had to operate on the principle of one person, one vote, maintain an open door policy for new members, ensure that members were at least 50% of the workforce and obey limits on the capital shares of members and the rate of interest paid on members' capital contributions. Member shares were made non-transferable at least 20% of firm profit had to be placed in a collective reserve fund, which could not be recouped by individuals leaving the firm. And the remainder had to be used either for reinvestment for social security or for social security purposes. Of course, there were subsequent developments, which I cannot get into, all of which, of course, the governments of the Silvio Berlusconi, I think the first of which was instituted in 1991 after some, uh, some controversy, uh, was in fact quite uh, negative, had a negative impact on the cooperatives. Um, and I should, probably should also mention the Marcora law, which allowed for the um, takeover of um, firms by the employees. And I actually should mention it in more detail. A 1987 law uh, called the Marcora law, named after an Italian lawmaker that spearheaded the initiative, facilitated the spread of cooperatives in Italy by creating a fund to finance the takeover of failing firms by workers. Employees in the troubled firm were required to invest personal wealth. Additionally, the state would provide certain grants in the place of unemployment compensation. Moreover, cooperatives choosing to contribute to the financing of these takeovers were assisted by matching contributions by the state. From 1987 to 1991, 86 cooperatives involved 3,254 employees were created uh, this way, most, mostly in furniture, clothing, textiles, and footwear, and printing. Since the European Commission's 2001 decision that I've already mentioned to claim grants under the Makora law, illegal state aid, a new system of equity investment and loans from cooperative Cooperazione Finanza Impresa, CFI, or one of the central associations financial agency, like Co-op Fund, which I have discussed uh, a, in a, a prior module, has been introduced. Naturally, the question arises to what extent this institutional framework guided and nurtured the Italian cooperative movement in ways that did not occur elsewhere. What can be said is that the Italian system's attention to detail when dealing with issues affecting the cooperative sector is unique and that it is uh, possibly only matched by certain regions in Spain, although there is not a, such a similar federal legislation or national legislation in Spain, although there are some exceptions in the provinces or the autonomous provinces. Um, and that is a consequence of the relatively strong position of cooperatives prior to the fascist era, which did not see their eradication. A number of individuals at Liga Coop and Coop Fund, as well as various uh, worker cooperatives and social cooperatives visited remarked 
about the uniquely beneficent situation the Italian legal structure presents cooperatives with. It is uh, my opinion that if other states or regions desire similar success stimulating the growth of the cooperative sector, the Italian legal system is an excellent starting point. Mauro Iniego, Lega Coop's legal representative at the time, suggested that the lessons to be learned from the Italian experience include the tremendous benefits the cooperatives have experienced thanks to a sympathetic system of laws, which since the end of the Second World War, at least have placed emphasis on compensating for some of the weaknesses that cooperatives face in the open market. Uh, he also stressed in discussions that the distinction between the Italian and Spanish and the Italian and Anglo-American cooperative model Italian cooperatives are thoroughly multi-sector and stretch across the expanse of Italy, whereas Spanish cooperatives are re relatively restricted, as I mentioned, to one region, the Basque region in northern Spain, uh, whose uh, legal uh, codification of associated labor I have just uh, recounted in the last video of the, uh, of the last module. And American co-ops are relatively sector-specific in labor-intensive occupations like lumber and plywood. Moreover, cooperatives in Italy have been relatively successful in leveraging the profits and saturation of particular regions like Emilia Romagna and Tuscany in order to contribute to the development of underdeveloped regions. I return to this topic with respect to Puglia's community cooperatives in a moment. Pier Firstly, Piero Amirato comments that if one were to include all the dependent sectors like farmers that exclusively deal with cooperatives, the uh, cooperative sector would actually account for about 11% of the workforce and 10% of GDP. This is clearly a dramatic divergence in one magnitude larger than in comparable economies. As a comparison, cooperatives make up less than 1% of all firms employing more than one person in France, 1% of all firms in Uruguay, less than 1% in the UK, Germany, and the United States. Central associations like Lega Coop, which can provide associated firms with expertise, advice, capital, and facilitate discussions with creditors and municipal governments, certainly contribute a great deal as well, as the case of Lega Coop shows. I now move on to the case study, the first of the three case studies, with, which is um, the, that of the Italian uh, community cooperatives. Um, and in fact, I think I will actually make a standalone video for this. So this will be actually in the next video. Um, 